See this human here? Her name is Dr. Jessica Hua. So we're interested in tadpoles that are native to the U.S. and also invasive to the U.S. She studies the effect of pollution on amphibians, and I think her work is super fascinating. So I want to tell you about this paper she wrote called The Contribution of Phenotypic Plasticity to the Evolution of Insecticide Tolerance in Amphibian Populations. In the paper, she defines phenotypic plasticity as the capacity of a single genotype to produce different phenotypes in different environments. What this means in the context of amphibians is that frogs of the same genotype will exhibit different responses to pesticides depending on the environment that they were raised in. And the fact that this sort of thing happens raises some pretty hairy questions about the nature of evolutionary process. Traditionally, evolution was thought to work by naturally selecting individuals in a population who possess specific traits. So, if you have a bunch of frogs, some of whom are resistant to pesticides and others that aren't, an application of pesticides would select for the already resistant frogs, and then resistance would spread throughout the population. The problem is that this process depends on this trait for pesticide resistance being present already in at least some small number of frogs so that natural selection can then select them. If the trait isn't present to begin with, then it can't spread. But these pesticides are a super new invention. Frogs from even the recent past could not have resisted them because they didn't exist. So how could this trait for pesticide resistance evolve in the first place. This gets at a long-standing debate among biologists about the origins of novelty. How do genuinely new traits, traits without any evolutionary history, come into being? Well, the answer seems to lie, at least in part, in plasticity. plasticity as being kind of like physiological learning. Over time, plastic bodies can learn to adapt to a stressful environment. The frogs in this study can't evolve a specific gene which protects them perfectly from the pesticides, but their bodies can learn to make all these tiny little changes which helps reduce the harm that the pesticides cause. It's kind of like a mountain climber who can't get enough air when they're climbing a tall mountain. The climber's not going to evolve a new kind of hemoglobin or anything, but they can begin to pant, which might give them enough air to get to the top of the mountain. In the absence of genetic changes, bodies can change their physiology to adapt to new environments. And these new physiological changes create a whole new dimension of traits for natural selection to then act on. What I mean is that instead of being selected for pesticide resistance directly, the frogs can instead be selected for the speed and the ease at which their bodies adjust to the stress that the pesticides cause. Over time, this kind of selection to reduce the cost of the plastic response can actually result in innate pesticide resistance. This is one way in which genuinely new traits can evolve out of nothing. Here's what Dr. Hua did with her research team. They identified 15 frog populations in rural Pennsylvania. Some of those populations were located close to agriculture, and others were located further away. They gathered frog eggs from all of these different populations and then brought them back to the lab for testing. When the eggs hatched, they exposed them to pesticides and monitored the difference in resistance between the close and far populations. They predicted that the frogs from the close populations would be more resistant than the frogs from the far populations. But they also wanted to figure out how plasticity played into all of this, so they did something pretty cool. For some of the frogs they gathered, they just exposed them to a lethal dose of pesticide and then timed how long it took the frogs to die. This is how resistance is typically measured. But for other frogs, what they did first was expose them to a sub-lethal dose of pesticide. When the frogs were eventually exposed to a lethal dose of pesticides, what they found was that these frogs took significantly longer to expire. Phenotypic plasticity at work. So there were actually two kinds of variation that this study sought to measure. The first kind of variation was resistance itself. Some frogs would be more resistant, some frogs less so, based on where they came from. The second kind of variation was variation in plasticity. They predicted that some frogs would be more plastic in their pesticide response, and other frogs less plastic 
also based on where they came from. These three graphs show the experiment's hypotheses. Naive tolerance is a measure of how tolerant a frog is to pesticides having never been exposed to it before. They predicted that frogs that came from closer to agriculture would have a higher naive tolerance than the frogs that came from further away from agriculture. Induced tolerance is a measure of how much benefit a frog might get from being previously exposed to a sublethal dose when it is eventually exposed to a lethal one. Dr. Hua predicted that the frogs that came from the closest areas to agriculture would show the least amount of induced tolerance because most of their tolerance was innate. However, she predicted that the frogs that came furthest away from agriculture would have the highest amount of induced tolerance because they had not evolved innate tolerance. Remember, theory predicts that plastic responses to stress should evolve to become more and more innate the longer the population is exposed to that stress. This graph here combines the predictions of the first two. It predicts that when naive tolerance is high, induced tolerance will be low, and when induced tolerance is high, naive tolerance will be low. If this graph holds up, it will be really strong evidence that formerly plastic traits can evolve to become innate. So what were the results? Like all data, these scatter plots are a little bit messy, but in each of these cases, the slope of the scatter plot is the same as the slope of the prediction. This is really strong evidence that plastic resistance can evolve to become innate resistance. There's also this life history data, which says basically the same thing. These lines represent the portion of a frog population that remains alive at any given time after being exposed to a lethal dose of pesticide. These frogs up here, they came from populations that were very distant from agriculture. And this black line here represents the naive response. The gray line is the induced response, and the distance between the black line and the gray line is the magnitude of the induced response. So you can see that the frogs that came from distant agriculture, the ones that we would expect to be the most plastic, indeed, they had the largest induced response. These frogs down here, they came from populations that were very close to agriculture. And not only are the naive and induced response closer together, meaning there's less plasticity, but also the frogs survive significantly longer when exposed to the pesticide so that they're more resistant overall. The conclusion from this data is the same. Over time, plastic responses can evolve to become innate responses. This study was done using proximity to agriculture as a proxy measure for the population's long-term exposure to pesticide. Knowing the actual history of pesticide application on these frogs would make the conclusions much stronger, but even as they stand, they're quite striking. This study shows that even in frogs that have no history of pesticide exposure, plastic responses can provide a great deal of protection. And the study further shows that given the right selective pressures, plastic responses can evolve to become innate. This paper brings us one step closer to solving a very deep mystery. How is it that truly new abilities can evolve out of nothing? Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, click here to subscribe.